So good good morning, everyone. Good morning. Bonjour à tous. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas, for your very kind introduction, for your organization of this wonderful conference. Um, it's a fantastic lineup and great deal of work. So congratulations to you, Lilian, and your team for putting it together. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm very grateful to be here and to be able to present some research to everyone this morning that we've been doing on multilingual identity. It fits very well with a lot of what Terry was saying in his talk. I know what Terry said about recording, that it's uh, maybe not a good idea. Who knows? I'm doing this live. I'm not thinking maybe I should have recorded it. It would have been a less nerve wracking. But here we go. Um, we're going to talk about identity today, essentially, because um, we've done a project over the last, we set it up about six years ago, based on some other PhD work on identity, which it's sought to think about how people can explicitly consider themselves as users of other languages. And we saw some beautiful examples from Terry's own work about how multilingual children, plurilingual children can think about themselves. But we thought, let's take this into the classroom and let's think about everyone in classrooms, multilingual identity. And some of it was very much based in, in what Terry was presenting about people's lack of understanding of what it means to use a language, to use a language at home, to use a language in the, in the community. Um, and that is coming from a space of considering yourself perhaps a monolingual in a, mono, in a setting where one would prefer it to be a monolingual setting. And we thought that perhaps there's some way of educating children, including those who do consider themselves monolingual and those who consider themselves multilingual, or not, even if they have languages in their background, they might still not consider themselves multilingual. Wouldn't it help if everyone could consider an identity as multilingual? Um, because that might bring some benefits and it may well cross some of the bridges and borders that we've been talking about today. So that's where the, where the uh, research was situated. So I'm going to, uh, I'm trying to move forward, but it's not working, here we go. Uh, so we, our team of researchers uh, is based in Cambridge. Some people now moved on to, to Glasgow as well. And uh, these are some of us, um, and the, the group leader of these, of these people. Um, we're also the basis part of a larger project, which is called the MITES project. It's multilingualism, empowering individuals, transforming societies, which is a very large project, um, which sought to um, bring together various disciplines, including some of the work of Thomas Bach, who you'll be hearing from in a, in a, plenary, in a keynote speech, um, working at the cognition end of things, and also people working in literature, cinema and culture and so on. And we were based in education somewhere in the middle. So the team was looking at the opportunities and challenges of multilingualism, the relationship between multilingualism, monolingualism, the individual and society, and so on, which you can see some of the things we were focused on there. But essentially, the main thing we were thinking about on our strand was how do we influence attitudes towards multilingualism and thinking about issues of diversity and identity, particularly as well. So we wanted to think about how we theorize multilingual identity in a school context. We wanted to have a look at how multilingual identity develops in the classroom as one learns foreign languages. And we wanted also to think about investment. Does having a multilingual identity improve investment in language learning? Um, does it, um, it have other be knock-on benefits, including um, motivation, achievement, cohesion, and so on? So today I'm going to briefly think about First of all, what is identity and linguistic identity? The word gets used a lot, but what is essentially the identity of identity? Why then focus on multilingual identity in particular rather than identity in each of the languages that may be in my repertoire? And then how does it maybe help us cross borders? And then how can we actually develop a multilingual identity if we accept that it might be a good thing? How can we practically do that? How can we support people to develop it? So what is the identity of identity? Um, well, many people have worked in the field of identity, going back, I suppose, to one of the fathers of it, Eric Erickson, a very psychological or social psychological perspective on identity felt it was a developmental process which included individual and contextual dimensions. It developed over time 
and connected us with our past and our future. Um, and therefore, there was some possibility for identity shift, which is interesting, isn't it? Because we're thinking about how to develop people's identities. Other people working in a post a sociocultural perspective would emphasize, again, the social side of identity development and how the situations we find ourselves in really um, can constrain or can enable the way we present ourselves. And identity formation is necessarily mediated, therefore, by the contexts in which we find ourselves. It's very relational in terms of who we're talking to at that particular time and how we feel ourselves empowered or whatever. And it's very situated. And so identities tend to be seen as multiple, provisional, shifting, depending on context and so on and time. And then very famous scholar, Bonnie Norton, obviously produced one of these um, Quotations that get used all the time when people talk about identity, and that is that it is the way a person understands his or her relationship to the world, how that relationship is constructed across time and space, and how the person understands possibilities for the future. It's a very good sort of quotation that encapsulates lots of dimensions of identity. And people working in a sort of post-structuralist perspective on identity would say there is actually no core identity. Identity is always incomplete, always multiple and dynamic, and self-transformation is possible. Um, and it's, historic, it's socially constructed and historically situated. So where does all of that leave us? It leaves us by thinking that scholars working in all perspectives agree that identity is both individual and social. That identification is a process rather than a fixed condition. And as such, we can change our identities or actively at least create our identities. Language obviously is supremely important when we think about identity because it shapes um, identity and identity shapes language also. So there's an, there's an inseparable language identity nexus because all language acts are acts of identity, aren't they? How we, we present what we say and so on. Um, and so we've got to think that language identities are multiple and shift depending on how people are, are interacting, who they're interacting with and so, and so forth. So what is the difference then between a linguistic identity and a multilingual identity? People have been very concerned with like, linguistic identity for the past sort of uh, 40 years. Um, and linguistic identity essentially relates to the way one identifies or is identified by others in each of the languages in one's linguistic repertoire. So moving on then to think about that. So um, Claire Cram, she's a very famous scholar, um, works in all sorts of areas of, of language, but also interested in identity gave this other, a lovely quote saying, for young people who are seeking to define their linguistic identity and position in the world, the languages class is often the first time they are consciously and explicitly confronted with the relationship between their language, their thoughts, their bodies. Engaging with a different language sensitizes them to the significance of their own first language and of language in general. And much of this is indeed true, but the question I suppose is, is how explicit is that in the languages classroom? Do we consider issues of identity? Is it conscious? And therefore, um, are we doing enough, if you like, to think about identities and how they change as a result of languages learning? But why indeed should we in investigate identity in the languages classroom? Well, First of all, identity is hugely important for learning because if you have, you know, like this quotation, if you have a student that doesn't know who they are, do you think they care about what goes on in class? I mean, identity is important, as Terry pointed out as well. And also issues related to identity negotiation, investment and affirmation are directly related to patterns of achievement and underachievement among social groups. It depends what you think about yourself um, and it depends how you, what you think about yourself, how you present yourself and how other people therefore also construe what you're presenting. So identity is important. It's, it's important socially and it's important in fact from a justice perspective 
And there are many, many um, writers who've been thinking about identity in school in general and how identity is really central to everything that goes on. Um, so it's a basic goal because language transform, learning transforms our identities and so on. I'm not going to take you through all these quotations, but people can see that you know, this is widely accepted that identity is a very fundamental thing to be considered in languages classrooms. I'm going to move on quickly then to think about multilingualism and multilingual identity rather than identity which situates in a particular language. Now, as we know, there's been a multilingual turn. There might even be a push away from multilingual lingualism, as um, well, but that's another debate for another day. Um, onto a sort of um, uh, along the sort of translanguaging line, but we can see that there has been a, fo a focus on multilingualism as a phenomenon. We've had the turn, and we've had then consideration now to issues around multilingual self and multilingual identity, moving away from sort of monolingual mindsets, if you like, of previous research who are thinking about, for example, who am I in a particular language, really thinking about who am I as a user of language um, in a more general sense. And therefore, perhaps a need for a pedagogy to support the development of identity competence and in particular multilingual identity competence. Are we helping children to think about their identity as it changes and, and so on as they learn a language? And are we helping them to think about how what they're learning in their languages classroom fits with the rest of their identity as a user of language? So I suppose we have to think about what do we mean by multilingual? Well, we take in our project um, where you can see the little um, logo at the right hand side, the We Are Multilingual, we've got this multilingual campaign, which we've had for several years. And what we mean by multilingual is a very all encompassing thing. So what we consider it to be is more about a relationship with a linguistic repertoire rather than the exact constitution of that repertoire, although the two may correlate. So if we were as researchers to identify participants in our research, i.e. children in school learning languages, we would describe everyone the term multilingual because we see a repertoire of language in the round. Everyone can use a language of schooling, for example. Everyone is learning the foreign language in the classroom. They all have a repertoire of other of other communicative resources that they can draw upon. So multilingual identity is an explicit understanding of yourself in, in, in a user of more than one language in its widest sense. So that could be any communicative resource. It could be being able to code. It could be using some form of sign language. It could be using emoji. All of these are communicative resources. So those can all be part of your repertoire, along with the languages learned in school, along with the languages spoken at home. So everyone's multilingual. People who speak several languages in their families, got home languages, and people who perhaps might be um, identified as monolinguals in society and might also identify as monolinguals in society. So multilingual identity is an umbrella identity that encompasses, but in important ways, transcends a person's language-specific identities. And we've written about this in one of our papers, which I've also put on the, the platform that you can have a look a link to. So why focus on multilingual identity um, in, this, in a school context and how does it help us cross borders? Well, I suppose the main thing to think about is that if I've got an identity as a multilingual, that can remain constant despite any changes to my linguistic repertoire. So if I can consider myself at a higher level as multilingual and say, yes, I am multilingual, then it doesn't matter if one of my languages drops down because I can think, well, it's still in there. Proficiency is not really important. It's still there. It's part of my repertoire. I can brush it up at another time. Um, and therefore, that's a constant back to the identity uh, research that we looked at, something slightly more core that can go through your life with you once you've taken that identity as multilingual. People can be proud of all the languages in their repertoires. So my marginalized and minoritized languages 
can be valorized. So people can start to feel prouder of the languages that they speak at home, maybe express that more readily, because sometimes, as Terry said, nobody knows what people are speaking at home. They don't really talk about it. They don't know if it's acceptable to talk about it. People can be proud of everything that is part of their repertoire. It can remove hang-ups regarding proficiency, because if we can say that everyone can be multilingual, then that's fine. And people might invest in their language learning now and in the future. People may develop better empathy and intercultural understanding because once I understand my own repertoire and I'm happy talking about it, you talk about your repertoire, we see what we've got in common, we see difference, it becomes more natural because we're all multilingual to one extent or another. And in fact, it can help to valorize, as we said, people who've got more than one language become proud of it rather than sort of not being sure whether they can talk too much about it. So linguistic resources can be thought about more holistically. What does our class speak? What languages have we got here? Which resources have we? Which, what has our school got? What has our society got? And that could also lead to better social cohesion. And perhaps better language awareness, as we know, can lead to help with literacy and oracy. And achievement may also improve um, in, in learning more generally. So we set out to actually research it and to see if, um, you know, how this actually works on the ground in schools and so on. So we worked in, in the southeast of England in, in, in seven different schools, which were very varied schools in terms of being urban or rural, <clears throat> um, whether the size of the school, the demographics, whether there were many first languages, other first languages spoken, socioeconomic status and so on. And we worked with a rather large number of participants. We gathered up quantitative and qualitative data, um, and uh, we also looked at the achievement of the students in school. And then we did a, an experiment in school as well, a quasi-experimental intervention to look at materials to get people um, activated to thinking about their multilingual identity. We theorised identity as being made up with three main components. One was experience. What experiences of languages have you in your background? Have you lived in other countries? Do you speak other languages at home? What have you learned in classroom scenarios? And so on. Evaluation. Language beliefs. What do I think about languages, its importance, and so on, difficulty. Self-beliefs. What do I think about myself in relation to those? And then others' beliefs. What do I think other people think about languages and what do they think about me as a language learner? Because obviously, again, think, trying to reflect on the ascriptions of other people towards myself might also be important in, in my identity construction. And obviously, emotion is also a hugely important thing when one thinks about one's repertoire and also especially in relation to oneself or what other, my, others might believe about you. There's a lot of emotion involved in that. Um, so that, can, that uh, was our theoretical background. We tried to capture identity by asking people about languages, as we said. Um, and we use the term here EAL, but I'm going to come on to unpack that in a moment or two, English as an additional language. We asked people to sort of uh, rate themselves on a scale, whether they felt they were multilingual or monolingual. And we asked them about other people's evaluations as well, as I mentioned, parents, teachers, and friends. We captured emotions through questionnaire items and metaphor elicitation. And we uh, are writing some of this up again in uh, an article that's coming out next week. Um, so um, I'm just looking at time and I'm thinking about which aspects to go for here. So I think we'll, we'll think about this a little bit first. Um, there are different ways that schools, for example, can ascribe multilingualism to learners. Um, um, so we need to sort of think about whether this is a school label of multilingual or in England, we would call that EAL, English as additional language, whether it's a self description in terms of whether the student would say, yes, I am EAL because I've got these languages in my profile and whether that would in turn lead them to say that they are multilingual. So we ran some tests to see if how people identified 
or were identified had a link with achievement. And we found that indeed it did. So if the school had identified someone as EAL, multilingual, if you like, then only Spanish showed any improvement when we came to the exams at 16. If students had identified themselves as EAL, then we found that all modern languages and science, interestingly, showed some significant improvement at GCSE. But interestingly, if students had identified as multilingual, whether they had home languages in their background or not, because we had some people identifying as multilingual, we'd only just been learning a little bit of language in school for a year or two. But interestingly, if the student identified as multilingual, then there was a significant improvement in all GCSEs, except for English language and history. So we found that rather an interesting um, finding, and it's written up in the paper that I just showed you. So we can say that when it comes to multilingualism, what you think you are might be more important than what others say you are, as we saw from the academic achievement there, and that the evaluative and emotive dimensions of multilingualism may have a greater effect on attainment than experience. And that's also quite an interesting finding. So how can we help students to identify themselves as multilingual? So we decided to do the intervention in school to have a look and see what would happen if we were to try to make some more explicit thinking about identity in the classroom and multilingual identity. So there were three dimensions to this. this. We introduced lots of knowledge about multilingualism. What does it mean to speak other languages? What benefits does it bring? And so on. Then we brought up some multilingual identity awareness, thinking about aspects of language use that might be reflective of identity. I'll show you some examples in a moment. And then we introduced for some students an element of reflexivity. What does this mean for me? What does it mean for my learning? What does it mean for me in the future? And this is how we theorized it. Um, uh, again, you can read about that in a paper. So I'll not have time to go into it in great depth. We produced a package of materials uh, for teaching in the secondary classroom, in the French, German and Spanish classroom for teachers to deliver and teachers deliver these materials. We've also produced a pack of resources for teachers in primary school and for the whole school to try and think about a multilingual space. The school is a multilingual space and the sorts of things we tried to get across lots of key messages um, in the materials to try and raise awareness of the diversity of language histories and so on, to try and help them understand how language in its wider sense can vary um, um, and uh, even languages in the community, trying to think about the spaces in which people live and how multilingual those spaces might be. There's many more key messages. And then we got in classrooms people to think about these things. Can you say yes to any of this? Because if you can, you're probably multilingual. So giving people the agency, we weren't requiring people to say they were multilingual if they didn't want to, but opening their minds to think that I could claim that identity label if I wanted to, because if I've got a dialect, or if I read books or watch videos in other languages, um, or if I use sign language or computer code, then maybe that can be construed as part of an identity as multilingual. And I can claim that. Um, there's no one gatekeeping this and telling me I need a certain proficiency. I can do this for myself if I want to. So in classrooms, we got them to do this, put themselves on scales and then discuss it. Uh, so it opened up space for discussion in classrooms. This is the sort of thing we told them, but knowledge about languages and so on. We thought about dialects, whether a dialect makes you multilingual or not. We thought about accents and what that says about who you are and whether you can be proud of an accent, whether it matters that you have an accent in another language and so forth. We got people to reflect on what, people, what they thought before, what they thought now, whether they would tell other people about what they learned today. That was an interesting angle because they took some of this information out to their families and so on. And this is, where, this is where you can find the resources for the classroom. I'm not going to get into too much of the research design now because time is moving on. But if I show you that some of that is written up uh, in again in another paper um, where we actually think about the influence of that identity-based pedagogical intervention in the classroom in more detail. We can certainly say that when we did the intervention, 
scores for pride in languages showed a significant increase. People were much more likely to say they were proud of languages that were in their repertoire. And that was very interesting, especially for children who did have other home languages. So the emotions definitely changed as a result of doing the, um, the project. Um, in terms of evaluation of languages, we found that actually knowledge about languages and those beliefs about languages didn't shift very much, but actually um, we may understand that students understood more about valuing the language, but really what was really important in terms of developing a multilingual identity was reflecting on what it meant for the learner themselves. Let's see a few examples of some of the things that learners were telling us. So I'm saying non-EAL student just because it's a handy label, but I understand the complexity of it. Some of, uh, you know, this ability to claim an identity. The student said, I didn't think about it before because a lot of my friends have different backgrounds, speaking different languages, being multilingual. But I didn't think about that for myself. But I do think about now that's me. So it's changed my opinion of it. So someone who thought they couldn't say they were multilingual before, after the intervention said, yeah, OK, I probably could say that if I wanted to. And an EAL student after the intervention, I don't know, but it feels good because it feels nice to know more than one language. It's kind of like I feel blessed because others don't know more than one language. And I feel like that's it. They felt, they felt good. They felt able to express pride in, in having more languages in their background. Students told us that they liked having this space for reflection. So you can see in the quotation, it made me think more about language. What is language about? Why do I speak it? What's the background and so forth? And it made me think about multilingualism, monolingualism and multilingual people. It helped people to understand others who we are crossing the borders. Um, it helped me think about languages in terms of being a more valued member of society because you can know more about other people and their backgrounds through learning languages in the languages classroom. It helped them think about cultural diversity. So some of them said, well, I knew this school was a little diverse, but actually it made me think, understand that actually diversity is everywhere. And it's very interesting, again, this, um, this idea of pre and post. So this EAL student said when they first filled out, you know, the, the, the sort of talking about which languages they had, like filling out the questionnaire and filling out the little activities, um, they weren't sure whether the friends would think she's a bit weird, she can talk that language. But then afterwards, I feel like everyone knew that I spoke a different language and then they wouldn't push me away. They were happy with me speaking another language and I do feel part of another language. So it gave her the confidence to talk about language. And in fact, it gave her a value because other people in the classroom were saying, wow, you, you speak these languages, wow. And made people aspire actually to learn more languages and to have a wider repertoire. So it seems to us that this participative multilingual identity education is quite an important angle on this. We have to educate, we have to help people in the classroom to consider their identities in this way in order that things will shift. Because if we think that having a multilingual identity might be a good, uh, a value, then we have to help people to get there. So uh, I said most of that. I think we need explicit engagement in the, in the classroom. Um, I don't think we need to say much more. So at that point, because I'm on 30 minutes, I'm going to say uh, thank you so much for listening. Merci, vielen Dank. Um, and I'd be happy to take a couple of questions. I think there might be time for, for one or two questions.